Hey guys, you're back here with Barry, and uh, if you hear a little bit of wind noise, you'll have to excuse it, but it is so nice to be outside again. Hey, listen, uh, special thanks going out to Robert over in Mongolia. Okay, so uh, here I am by the ocean, and you can't get any more landlocked, I guess, in Mongolia. Anyway, Robert, uh, a big high five is going out to you for this. Uh, I want to introduce you to a... Um, I would definitely have to say a, a fairly enlightened woman. Uh, she has a wonderful channel called Amazing Polly. And um, I want you to sit back and have a listen. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's just uh, what I think when we talk about the mentors and us, us, us guys being together for over three decades, this is one of the best examples of what one section of apophatic study is all about. And uh, again, as I'm saying, that's what our our, uh, our little think team does uh, for over three decades. There's four of us. This is definitely one clear phase of apophatic or onion peeling, as uh, some people will call it. Uh, again, we're going to have a listen here, but I would say one of the best quick examples I can give you of what, what we're talking about this kind of study is Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes never found who was guilty. He eliminated everybody else who could not be. And besides of Watson's or his personal feeling or anybody else in the Sherlock Holmes tri uh, trilogy uh, would have to put their side. I mean, the last person standing that fit all of the description when everyone else was eliminated had to be the guilty. Uh, I guess her name's Polly, but Polly does an excellent job of following the money, which is one aspect of apophatic research. Okay, watch. This is great. I have some booms for you today. Booms relating to the world of global public health and specifically related to the pandemic. By the end, I'm sure you'll see why we call it Plandemic. I've already done videos about this, I know, but this is all new information and I haven't seen some of this covered anywhere. The information is going to include new background on Event 201, on Anthony Fauci. We're going to talk more about Bill Gates and some of the characters we've already discussed. But what is being revealed, not just by myself, but tons of excellent research out there. But what is being revealed, in my opinion, is that the world of global public health, public health in general, is run like a mafia. It It's like there's a Don somewhere and he's got all these families that go by NGO names, that go by world body names. These are like mafia families. And they're using money laundering and extortion and a kind of a protection racket scheme to uh, cripple nation states and at the same time, of course, enrich themselves. So that's where we're going today. And like I say, boom, boom, boom. I believe there's some really shocking information in here. The only way I know how to tell this story to you is to kind of go through how I discovered it. And so the first thing that led me to what I'm going to cover today was this. I don't know if you caught this thing. It was a two and a half hour long telethon sort of thing. This pledging event, they called it, hosted by Ursula van der Leyen, the president of the e EU. Over the course of this two and a half hours, they had a whole string of world leaders that sounded like they were reading hostage notes, that they were given a script and they had to read this thing to the camera and give up in the end, $8 billion of taxpayer money, all told from all of their citizens. So you and I are paying for this thing. Uh, just listen to a, a few, a select few world leaders and what it sounded like to listen to them. Better diagnostics, treatments, and a safe and effective vaccine. COVID-19 diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. Largement du développement et du déploiement rapide de diagnostics, vaccins, et traitements efficaces. Universal access to vaccination, treatment, and diagnostics. Equitable access to new COVID diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. We must all work together on improving diagnostics, accelerating therapies, and ultimately developing a vaccine. 
we need to make vaccines, treatment and diagnostics accessible to everyone. Vaccines, treatments and diagnosis will be the most effective way to do it. We need new diagnostics, vaccines, treatments and an equal distribution to all. On equitable access to diagnostics, treatments and vaccines. And affordability of the vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. In order to develop adequate treatments and vaccine. I don't know about you, but that was embarrassing for me to hear them back to back saying basically the same thing that they were obviously told to say by somebody. The question is, who is that somebody? Where is this money that's being pledged going? Well, I do have an answer for you for that. I'll get to that a little later. But the interesting thing about this pledging event was that in addition to the world leaders, Ursula van der Leyen also had on testimonials from the people who are going to be benefiting from this. And here's um, Ursula van der Leyen just really quickly introducing each one of them so you get to familiarize yourselves with the names of the organizations. For the World Health Organization, Director General Dr. Tedros. And now we move on to the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, for the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for Gavi, the Vaccines Alliance, for the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, CEPI. Without you, Victor, my friend, all this would not have happened. I'm Victor Zhao, president of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine and a board member of GPMB, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. The one that set me off on this journey today was the very last one there, Victor Zhao. Victor Zhao, who they said was president of the National Academy of Medicine and a board member of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. And I thought to myself, I've never heard of the Glo uh, monitoring board, but why would she say? Without you, Victor, my friend, all this would not have happened. So I thought it's worth a look into Victor Zhao's background. So that's what we're going to start with. Victor Zhao, first of all, he was born in China, and I'm sorry, but in today's day and age, when we understand subversion and we understand how China has slowly compromised the United States. It's significant, in my opinion, that Victor Zhao was born in China and that his father owned a chemical manufacturing company. Well, chemical manufacturing, that is big pharma. Most people, I guess, well, I don't know. I used to think of chemical manufacturing as chemicals. I didn't put it together that it was drugs and poisons and insecticides and things like that. But that's what it is. So that's Victor Zhao's family. He's also married to a very progressive, I think, Jewish woman, which I'm only mentioning because he's won awards from the Jewish community. So he's very well supported there as well. Um, but listen to just some of the things Victor Zhao does and did. President of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, serves as vice chair of the U.S. National Research Council. He's Chancellor Emeritus and James B. Duke Professor of Medicine at Duke. He was also Chairman of Medicine at Harvard, as well as Chairman of Medicine at Stanford U. And he served on the Board of Health Governors of the World Economic Forum and chaired its global agenda. He was also on the advisory committee to the NIH director, and that's significant because Anthony Fauci at the NIAID is in the National Institute of Health as well. And there's so much more that isn't listed in that 2018 biography that I just showed you. So one of the things they talked about was that he is chairman of NAM, the National Academy of Medicine. Just get a load of this logo, by the way. I know medicine is associated with a snake, but it's usually on the caduceus. To remove it from that is a little odd. And to have it arranged so that there are three sixes showing in the loco, also, it's just 
It raises a red flag for me. How can it not? I don't know if you can see the three sixes and it's hard for me to point them out. The one is right in the middle. You can see that one. Then there's like a big one that is the whole outside like that. There's the one that comes from the neck of the snake and up and back around this way. Victor appeared at a nurse's conference and it Instead of me reading this to you, why don't I let you watch the clip? So as of July 1, 2014, we reconstituted the National Academies so that the IOM is now a National Academy itself, hence called the National Academy of Medicine. Although we call it National Academy of Medicine, I don't want you to say, have this name, uh, fool you to think we only focus on medicine. We are us about health. It's a much broader mission. And I want to make sure you get that message. There are many different reasons why we use this name for internal purposes, and etc. The second is to create reports that these recommendations are our recommendations, and frequently because our work is also commissioned by Congress, by U.S. government, and by global governments, they are the recommendation for policy, for legislation, for law, etc. Did you notice that he tells them not to be confused by the name? And he said, we use that name for a lot of reasons. It almost is like we need to uh, keep up credibility. We need to keep up appearances. The National Academy of Medicine, which was founded by an act of Congress, is no longer part of the government. Here is how the National Academy of Medicine gets its funding now from these foundations. Of note, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, the Rockefeller Foundation, the U.S. State Department through the uh, USAID, USAID, and the World Economic Forum. You will notice is an over, is part of the oversight group. Some of these double up. The Wellcome Trust is part of the oversight group. The Rockefeller is part of the oversight group. And to me, when I discovered that, that was a boom. The National Academy of Medicine is actually a 501c3 organization, a foundation, and it's funded by other foundations. And it just so happens it's founded by, it's funded by some of the usual suspects. I mean, just for your reference and records, here is a graphic. All right, the other thing that they said that he was part of is this GPMB, Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, and I was very curious about that as well. It turns out you don't even need to look hard. The GPMB is, it is the World Health Organization and World Bank. You can see it's co-convened in May 2018 by the World Bank Group and the World Health Organization. So it just made itself a seemingly independent organization. So when the public hears it, they're not going to think, oh, that's the World Health Organization again? That's the World Bank again? God, they do a lot of stuff. No, no, no. It's a front organization, isn't it? I mean, they don't hide it, but you have to go looking for it to find it. The funders of the GPMB are the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, Germany, and this NGO called Resolve to Save Lives, which is run by a guy called Tom Frieden, who is the former head of the CDC and the former New York Health Commissioner. He also worked on Bloomberg Philanthropies. We're not going to talk very much about him today. That's left for another dig. On the GPMB website, we see that they had commissioned several organizations to write them reports about global health. And those organizations are down here. Red Cross, Johns Hopkins, Chatham House, Welcome. And believe it or not, they even asked themselves, the World Bank and the World Health Organization, to write these reports. Down here, they specifically thank a guy called Tim Evans. And we're going to get to him in a minute. Just remember that they said that. Here's the reports that resulted from this commissioning. I just want to draw your attention to to this particular one, which was written by the Independent Oversight Committee for the WHO Health Emergencies Program. The title of it is From Never Again to the New Normal. That's kind of creepy because aren't they constantly saying that to us right now? The new normal, the new normal. And that report was written before this one, which came out in September 2019. 
I know that because this report written by the GPMB took the results of all of these and then made sort of a synopsis document here. I'm going to give you now a very quick look at their seven most important points that came out of all of those reports. <laughs> You're going to love it. The GPMB says seven urgent actions to prepare the world for health emergencies. They must prioritize and dedicate domestic resources and recurrent spending for preparedness towards the sustainable development goals. That's point one of what the GPMB wants and what all those other seven organizations recommended as well. Remember that. So here's points two and three. Countries and regional organizations must lead by example and follow through on their political and funding commitments. They must build strong systems. This is point number three. The heads of government must use a whole of government and whole of society approach. They must prioritize community involvement in all preparedness efforts, building trust and engaging multiple stakeholders. I don't like this whole of government plus whole of society approach to preparedness because what does that sound like? That sounds like totalitarianism. And isn't that what it feels like we're living under today with everybody get out at eight o'clock and clap. Oh, clap and show your commitment to our preparedness efforts or our response efforts. Wear the mask or else you're a pariah. Snitch on your neighbors if they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah, it reminds me of what we're going through today a lot. Here's points four and five, which also have to do with funding. They must ensure adequate investment in developing in innovative vaccines and therapeutics and more financing money for the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And also down here where the arrow is funding replenishments of the IDA Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria and Gavi. Gavi and the Global Fund, those are Bill and Melinda Gates efforts and the IDA. Well, I noticed that it had a very similar logo to the World Bank. And of course, that's because it is part of the World Bank. And here's just more. Increase funding. That's point number six. You see how they worked it. The World Health Organization and the World Bank created this seemingly independent body called the GPMB. And then the GPMB puts out a call for reports. And they ask Johns Hopkins, Chatham House, welcome International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent and the World Bank and the World Health Organization to write these reports. And then this organization aggregates the results of these reports and makes another report in which it recommends increasing funding to all the people who fund the GPMB and the World Bank and the World Health Organization. I wanted to have a closer look at one of those reports. So I opened up to the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and it dawned on me, Johns Hopkins is the organization who put on Event 201. The Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security in partnership with the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation hosted Event 201, a high-level pandemic planning exercise on October 18th, 2019. What? And wait a second. This report from the GPMB came out in September 2019. And October, they held the pandemic planning exercise. Now, remember I told you it's good to remember Tim Evans was thanked, particularly by the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board he used to work at the World Bank. Okay, there's, there's Tim right there. Tim also appeared at Event 201. We're not going to get into his background right now. What I want to do instead is play you a clip of Tim speaking as a panelist at the Event 201. Uh, everybody gets excited around a table like this in the moment, and then you, you, you move on, and it's back to business as usual. And it's this panicked and neglect problem that we have, uh, which is very difficult to prospectively uh, develop uh, real preparedness. So I think there should be somewhere, maybe it's out of the GPMB and a number of people here are uh, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. The GPMB is, it is 
the World Health Organization and World Bank. When the public hears it, they're not going to think, oh, that's the World Health Organization again? That's the World Bank again? It's a front organization. There should be a, a time-bound plan uh, with uh, uh, very clear targets with respect to what would constitute um, a new level of global preparedness. And we should look at what's required to get that financed, uh, but uh, that it, it, it has some real accountability to agents that um, are, lie behind or are, 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 are advocating for a stronger global governance. What was his main point? We need to get that financed. To get that financed. He said. He laments the fact that they do these planning things, but because there's never pandemics, people don't tend to follow through on their funding. So they need something that's going to get this financed for once, he says. Right? In October 2019, Tim Evans of the World Bank, that was his main concern. And you saw that Bill and Melinda Gates were sponsors of that project, Event 201, and all the reports that went into it. This writer on May 2nd wonders why Bill Gates is denying Event 201. And it's not like Bill Gates was asked about Event 201 and then said, no, I know nothing about this, it never happened. But what he did say was, on April 12th, 2020, Bill Gates said in an interview to the BBC, quote, now here we are, we didn't simulate this, we didn't practice, so both the health policies and economic policies, we find ourselves in uncharted territory. Which is not true. Because Event 201 was very extensive, and it focused very much on economics, financing. But what it really, really focused on, if you watched it, if you've seen my videos and others, you'll know, was controlling the message. It wanted to flood the zone with their own propaganda. A, a couple of strategies that are available to us, one of which is the flood strategy. And flooding good information. Flood the zone. Flood. A manifestation of flood. Flood, flood good zone. information. Flood the zone. And what have we seen? We've seen nonstop uh, coronavirus messaging everywhere. They're also censoring anything that goes counter or exposes them. For example, my video on Event 201 that I did months ago, which got almost 400,000 views, ixnay. They're also trying really hard to censor Judy Mikovits's anything she does, anything she does, they try to censor it because she's exposing Dr. Anthony Fauci for the fraud that he is. Now, why would Bill Gates want to deny Event 201? Well, maybe because if you look at it, you'll see the guy from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, there he is right there. You want to look at the Event 201 players? Christopher Elias, along with Timothy Evans and many others. Chris Elias, he is the face of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I thought to myself, while I'm looking at board members, let's look at the board members of the GPMB, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, who we now know was involved in the background setup of Event 201. Let's look at the board. Well, there's Victor Zhao. There's Chris Elias again. And there's Jeremy Farrar. Hang on. There's Jeremy Farrar. There's Jeremy Farrar. Wow, I'm starting to see a massive pattern emerge, aren't you? And this guy, George Gao, he was also at the event 201 as one of the players. And he is he is from China's CDC, China's Center for Disease Control. But you notice I blacked one of the people out. I redacted them. And that's because I want you to have been fully prepared for the boom. Are you ready? Who lies behind? the redaction. Anthony Fauci. Anthony Fauci, the guy leading the coronavirus task force. You guys all already know who he is, but there he is on the board of the Global Preparedness 
monitoring board. Who was responsible for commissioning all of those reports? All of the reports that gets funding from these guys over here, which made its own report that eventually translated to Event 201. There he is there with all the usual suspects. Boom. All right. Gosh, it's getting long, and I still haven't covered all the other booms. Just in case you weren't aware, Anthony Fauci gave an interesting speech at Georgetown University shortly after Trump was inaugurated, and here's what he had to say. Um, I thought I would bring that perspective to the topic today is the issue of pandemic uh, preparedness. And if there's one message that I want to leave with you today based on my experience, and you'll see that in a moment, is that there is no question that there will be a challenge to the coming administration in the arena of infectious diseases, both chronic infectious diseases in the sense of already ongoing disease, and we have certainly a large burden of that, but also there will be a surprise outbreak. And I He had no doubt that there would be a surprise pandemic? How can you have no doubt that there will be a surprise? It's a contradiction in terms. But yeah, isn't that very interesting? And just let me add this little part. So from my own personal experience is why I can say with some confidence that history tells us that we will definitely get surprised in the next few years. So it all started for me when I became director of NIAID, and that was in 1984. And, uh, I had my uh, uh, graphics people do it, a, a, a sort of a, a, a map of the United States of America. And I put on the map this new emerging infectious disease, which is HIV AIDS. And I take that map, and one way or another, every single time I testify before the Congress, particularly for my budget, almost always for my budget, and I talk about global health and emerging infectious diseases, I add one, sometimes two, sometimes three, either new diseases or re-emerging diseases. <laughs> He's kind of just laying it bare right there. Every time he had to go up in front of Congress for his budget, he would just add in infectious diseases onto his map. Yeah, that works, I guess, eh, Anthony? It shows he doesn't even see what we see when we hear him say that. Just another little bit about Anthony Fauci before we move on. He was at the Bill and Melinda Gates Global Grand Challenges Scientific. I'm going to have the end because there's about another uh, 10 to 12 minutes on this. I just uh, want to say, first of all, thanks goes out to Robert in Mongolia. Uh, also, thanks goes out to Amazing Polly and her research and channel. But uh, I do want to bring a couple things out to notice here, and that's why I cut it short, not for lack of interest, but I don't want to make the video too long. Well, again, repeating, we'll have a link, a direct link there to BitChute for it to help her get this out because it's excellent uh, in terms of that. But this is uh, one aspect of what we call apophatic research. Um, onion peeling. You can see where it goes from layer to layer to layer to layer. Uh, it's a method of following the money, following the names, and it is one uh, area that the mentors for over three decades were four people, as you know. Uh, each one of us takes various areas because as we started unfolding what's going on here, areas opened up into areas, opened up into areas, and uh, Polly's doing an excellent job of tracking the dollars and the names in one area, but we wanted to actually, and it was just, it got too much. So that's when we blended our talents a little over three decades ago about uh, we would each take two or three different categories, stick with what we were stronger with, then blend the information and come out to a source plus other outside sources that we pay for that are uh, websites or uh, companies that we pay for information, blend it together and, and see because weather affects everything. Uh, there's just everything affects everything. That's why we call it a transmission. But that's the real reason why, I, I mean, uh, the names are always the same in various areas and circumstances. It's an excellent form of apophatic study. Uh, 
but we also enjoy putting the pieces together and that's probably why the mentors have stayed together for so long as friends it's it's just a hobby but however it is a multi-layer process and one thing i want to caution and i see a lot of the people i just personally know as friends and that's who this is going out to. If I don't know you, I can't say this. But uh, it's one thing about apophatic research is it does get fascinating how it all starts to unfold and make sense. But don't get stuck there too long. In other words, uh, when I say it's a multi-point purpose to get to truth you have to keep moving forward 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 and 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 again uh what i mean by that is it's very easy to get stuck in what we call information overload or information overdose um kind of just a bit more blunt like uh, the way the mentors in the beginning that was a big thing for us and we found ourselves in the first oh i'd say about eight years we started to catch on seven, eight years that we're getting hung up on too much of the details. That's what we're getting hung up on is the details. We're not making the forward progress and staying ahead of the curves. We're chasing. Okay, we're chasing what's already what we already knew too many times. So kind of the way, forgive me when I say it, but um, after determining something's a turd from there, we don't need to send each one of them to a lab for analysis. Okay, like I say, three, four solid pieces of information to determine what is the substance, the information, what are you dealing with? What substance are you dealing with? After that, the mentors are off to the next station. I just encourage you because mm, um, I guess in closing, I want to say the most important thing, whether it's the tree of life or whatever, it's a belief or a balance is the most important thing. Remember, time, money, money, time, day, night, everything is balance. And um, it's sorting it all that takes the action in the time. And that's where I applaud people like that, because uh, I feel, you see, like I say, time is a, 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 a commodity, a commodity. And uh, I guess Polly might be her name, but uh, anyway, Amazing Polly is investing her time. And uh, But a lot of people I know invest their time in information, but they're going to be one of the most informed individuals sleeping in the FEMA bed next to the clueless idiot. That's all I'm cautioning about, okay? Uh, part of balance is strong action, too. And that's where we studied many different things about what people call about a plan B or do I want to be Daniel Boone? Absolutely not. But there's definitely ways to survive in certain areas and certain climates uh, on a much less stressful manner. That's all we're saying. So keep in mind balance because it is very easy to get trapped in information overload because it's so interesting about how this stuff starts to unfold. Okay. I encourage you watch the whole video. Maybe check out her channel. It looks like she'd have a lot of good videos pertaining to that. I just caution, don't get stuck in information overload. I have a lot of friends and contacts that are. Okay. Till next time, it's old Barry and Thanks again for everything. Uh, again, second, uh, really appreciate this. Robert from Mongolia. So you know who you are. There isn't too many people named Robert in landlocked Mongolia. Bye-bye.